Welcome back to A Nurse in the Kitchen. This is your girl Maggie. I am wrapping up uh, my post African trip video. This is the last one in the series. Trying to uh, share with you, I'm well, not trying, sharing with you um, some of the experiences I've had and how much of a an impactful trip it was. I uh, completed, I have completed two previous videos. The first one is just like basics of traveling abroad and like a 101 of what you need to do to get yourself ready. Uh, we'll talk about safety and arrival and, and all that good stuff. Then I, I shared with you my experience in Ghana, West Africa. So today I want to tell you about uh, my experience in Wanda in East Africa. I was in Ghana for two weeks and then I had some business interests in, um, in Wanda and I took a flight. Uh, it was almost, it was a five hour flight from uh, Accra, Ghana to Kigali, Wanda. So when you think of Africa and some people think it's one country, you know, from one country to the other, I flew five hours. <laughs> so that kind of tells you how vast this continent is, right? So um, I had researched more Ghana than I did Wanda, but I did do some of my uh, some of my homework in terms of the country, its size, its history. Uh, uh, its culture, and as I said, I am a very open-minded person, so I want to take it all in, right? Um, so, like any country, especially nowadays when you travel, you want to know what the COVID requirements are whether you need a visa or not. Now, I was only going to be there for five or six days, so I decided to do visa on arrival, which Rwanda is one of the countries that does that. Not every country in uh, Africa allows visa on arrival, but I think it costs $50, and they wanted to know what I was doing, why I was there, you know, tourism. Um... And, um, oh, I forgot to put language in my other video to talk about what language they speak. In, in, in Wanda, a lot of people speak English. The older generation speaks some French, but the main dialect there is called Kiaranda. Uh, and those languages are hard. I mean, when you hear them talk, I'm like, will I ever, if ever, understand that? <laughs> Um, so these are on arrival, they stamp it in before I could leave Ghana, I had to do a COVID test because you're not boarding that plane until they see that COVID, that negative PCR test, right? And same thing, 72 hours from your boarding, don't do it too early or you, or you will be out of compliance. So, and also when you're traveling to Africa, if you can print those results, please do so. Because they were like, no, I need a paper. Because, you know, they're not so high tech as we think they should be. So, even though it was in my phone, I said, I don't have access to a printer. And she's like, okay, here's an email address, just email it. So, it was, it worked out. When you get to Kigali, which is the capital of Wanda, you have to do another COVID test. And that one is, I don't think, no, it's not a rapid, but you got to pay $60 to get that done. And that was a throat swab. So that wasn't bad. Now, weeks ago, on the Wanda website, it said that if you tested positive, no, when you get there and they do the tests, you had to quarantine in one of their designated hotel, and there were a lot of hotels on that list, for 24 hours until you get a text on your phone that tells you what the results were. 
And I think about a couple of weeks before I traveled, they had changed that. That's why you have to keep up with reading the requirement because it does change. Now, it said, if you are fully vaccinated, which I am, and I had to show my card, then you don't have to quarantine in those designated hotel. You have to tell them where you're going to be so that, let's say, God forbid you tested positive, they can trace you to a hotel and take you to another hotel to be quarantined. But if you fully vaccinated, you are now allowed to, you know, go to your hotel and they would contact you if they needed to. So, of course, thank God I was okay. So, but <laughs> this trip was a little bit interesting. So, I had booked an airport pickup through, I want to say Expedia or one of those, Travelocity or one of them. Because my flight was arriving at about 1 a.m. in Kigali, and I thought in my head, I said, okay, I'm going to have to get a SIM card because, you know, I had a cheap phone in Ghana. I had to take that SIM card out and put a SIM card that was Rwandan so I could get a Rwandan phone number and I could take, get calls and texts, even though I still had WhatsApp, right? And I had to get some internet so I can, you know, when I'm traveling, I could have access to internet. When I got to Kigali at 1 a.m., everything was closed. I did not think about that. There was no place to exchange money. There was no place to buy a SIM card. So there I was. And then there was a gentleman standing. And I was like, come on, come on. They don't want you to stay inside the airport. So I was out. And I was like, well, thank God it's not burning hot. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I don't have access to a phone. I don't have internet to tell the guy who's supposed to pick me up that I'm here early. And I said, okay, what am I going to do? So I saw a couple of guys outside and I'm like, internet, internet. And because they, not all of them speak English. Remember that. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, no internet. No, no, no. I'm like, okay. I guess now I'm going to have to stand here outside the uh, airport and wait for the guy. You know, by that time it's like close to 2 a.m. Uh, so I can wait for the guy to pick me up. Then two beautiful young ladies, I call them the angels. They said, can we help you? And I'm like, oh, English. <laughs> English, yes, yes, yes. They said, we can do a hotspot and let you call the driver. And I'm like, hotspot? I don't know how to do that. She took my phone and blah, 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 put her little password in there and boom. And then the messages kept coming into my phone. I'm like, oh God. One of the messages was from the driver. He was like, oh, I see, because he was monitoring my flight. He said, I see your flight is here. I can't come pick you up, but I have a guy there who's going to pick you up. He's a taxi driver. And I'm like, so he gave me his number. So I'm trying to call him. The guy's sitting there. Oh, yeah, I'm so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, hallelujah. Thank you. So I had to thank you to those ladies. You know, again, for me, I said those were angels. So that was my first contact into Wanda, seeing the kindness of the people to just help a total stranger and offered. I didn't ask. They offered. So that was super Super, right? So I go in the car with this cab driver. Who doesn't speak English? <laughs> I'm like, vous parlez français? No, he doesn't speak French either. I'm like, oh, okay, it's going to be interesting. So I'm like, this is where I'm going. I'm like, do you know where it is? He's shaking his head. He could not tell me. And I got, I gathered he didn't know where the place was. And the place had good direction saying it's across from a girl's school. I'm like, well, then call the guy who was supposed to pick me up and ask him how to get there. So he's calling, blah, 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 talking to the guy. So he started driving really slow because he doesn't know where he's going. I'm like, oh my God, it's about 2.15, 2.30 in the morning. I am in a cab in Kigali in the middle of the night with a guy who doesn't speak English, who doesn't know where it's going. <laughs> oh my God. So I had, I had 
called uh, WhatsApp the manager of the building, and I said, I come in at 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. Can I come in? He's like, oh, yeah, you can come in. Oh, excuse me. I'm like, okay, that's good. So, in the middle of him driving really slow outside of the airport, not knowing where he's going, boom, we come to a police checkpoint. I'm like, oh, my Lord, here we go. There were three army-looking people with long rifles. Stop. I'm like, oh, okay. So he asked the guy for something. The guy did something in his phone, handed it, popped the hood. They have to look. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning and popped the trunk. I'm like, oh, my God. I That was my first foray into security in Wanda. In Wanda... You know, I, I have been reading that it is a police state. They can stop you at any time. They look through your car and search. And they tell me that they can tell if you have any outstanding like tickets or whatever. And you can get in trouble because they have cameras everywhere on the road. But the guy, somebody else, explained to me that they had just gotten out of quarantine. So uh, I think the quarantine was like midnight. So nobody really was supposed to be on the road late at night. So we were there at 2 o'clock. Of course, they had to stop us. But anyway, so they let us go. We still didn't know where we were going. The guy still, so I'm like, oh, my God. So I said, give me the phone. So I'm talking to this guy. And I'm like, well, he doesn't know where he's going. How? And he's like, oh, yeah, he should know. Finally, I said, why don't we call the manager of the apartment? Because it's an apartment building. So, oh, yeah, we'll call the manager. By that time, I think it took about an hour to get to where we were, we were driving. And I'm like, oh, here's the school. That was based on my direction. And then the guy was still there on the phone. Rah, 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 rah. I'm like, well, we're close to the, it's right across from it. We're looking for a gate number, this number. I felt like I wanted to rip the phone out of his ear and get it out and banging on these uh, gates so I can get in. Finally, we found the gate and we got in. Then we had to honk the horn in the middle of the night so the guard gatekeeper can get out of his bed, poor thing, at 3 o'clock in the morning to open the gate for us. So that was an eventful evening, you know, my welcome experience in Wanda. But then, you know, as I was driving, it was like, oh my God, look at all the greenery. Everything was so lush and green. It's just, Wanda Kigali is a beautiful, beautiful city. So I got in, I had I was in a two bedroom, three baths. Why do we need three baths in the bathroom? I don't know. Um, it was okay. There was a couch there. Apparently it's a sofa bed. And I look at the cover, the, I'm like, mm, I'm not sitting on that. So I ripped the sheet off of the other bed and I put it on there before <laughs> I could sit. And again, the mattress was hard, so I have nothing good to say about the mattresses there. Um, the windows were not shut, so they all had gaps, so sometimes mosquitoes got in there. So I was very careful. Even in Ghana, I didn't get bit at all. I stayed away from, um, you know, at night, and if, you know, those three nights where I had to go get food, I, I just spray. I always had my bug spray with me, and I gotten some lotion in, in Ghana that were anti uh, mosquito, they were repellent. So I put it in my ear and I put it in my legs, but <laughs> wherever. But one night I woke up and I had a big old welt on my forehead. Something bit me on my forehead because, you know, I put the repellent. I don't want to put some on my face, but I did after that, and then I never got another bite. Uh, I did see a few roaches in that apartment. I didn't in the other one in Ghana. And the Wi-Fi sucked. It was very spotty. It was very weak. 
and it was so frustrating for anything to upload. You could be, and then even the TV would just start working and it's like, oh, no signal. So Wi-Fi was an issue. And I had trouble with my phone. I could not get messages. I did not realize. Now in Ghana, I could make calls on that cheap phone. In Wanda, I could not. I had to buy minutes. So there were a couple of nights where I was trying, they use Vuba Vuba, which is a, a delivery food service because you know, I didn't know what was around and I was hungry. There was nothing in that fridge, even though I had a kitchen, but you know, it was like, I'd have to go to a store. How do I bring back food? You know, you gotta get your bearing. So I could not, uh, because they would ask for a local number because they have to send you a code and I could not get that. So I was like, oh my God, let me eat some more crackers. <laughs> I had gone to the store with um, the maintenance person and went to a store and got like some crackers and a thing of mango juice. So I lived on that for a couple of days before I figured out that I needed to buy minutes on that phone to be able to get messages back and forth. <sighs> but anyway, I booked a CD tour through, I think Expedia. So the day of the tour, I'm, you know, because you open the gate and I'm sitting outside. And I'm saying 15 minutes, 20 minutes, nothing, and 30 minutes. Finally, I text because I think they have sent me the driver's uh, contact. And I'm like, are you on your way? He said, uh, who are you? I'm like, oh, oh God. So he said he didn't have any information about having a tour with me that day. And he was in the mountain at a safari. I'm like, oh, okay. So what's gonna happen now? So he was so kind. He was able to find me a driver and it cost me less. I'm like, I'm not doing anything until I see a cancellation on, of the money I had paid for this tour. So it was cheaper. And then he sent me a guy. It took him about a couple of hours to get there. He was the nicest young man. Uh, Jacques, you know, he had a French name. Also, we bonded. He spent seven hours with me that day. We started at the Kigali Memorial, Genocide Memorial. Oh, my God. Whew, that was heavy. I mean, you've seen the pictures. I watched Hotel Rwanda several times. And, of course, I could not wrap my mind around the brutality of these people doing these kind of things to their neighbors and their brothers and sisters and uh, man. who that was bad. But just to see how far they have come in the reconciliation and, but you know, in the back of my mind, I can't help think that those Tutsis who were slaughtered, did they really forget and forgive? Because as a psychiatric person, uh, provider, I don't even know that I could thoroughly help these people to um, heal from that level of trauma. Some of them have lost their whole family. They're the only survivor. Just to think of running away from your neighbor, holding a machete, trying to, I, I don't know. I don't know that I could constantly, you know, totally help that level of PTSD and trauma. I don't know. Because I've heard some people speak that they're just not the same. They're just not, I don't know what normal is, but that they've been mocked irreversibly. And you know, I mean, I can't process it. I can't process that. 
but I know that it happens. Look at the Holocaust, even though some people are trying to say it didn't happen. Uh, it starts with somebody with some crazy notions, pitting one group against each other, airing grievances that may or may not be warranted, and just build that level of resentment and anger and people become possessed with these feelings and because when you see you read the history of the genocide in Rwanda this is something that was pre-programmed years before and it just was building and building and building and when that president plane got shut down it was just a moment that everything exploded and people, you know, when you go to the memorial, there were some survivors that tell you that once that plane was shut down and the order was given by, by the perpetrators, those people who were building and feeding into this madness, they sent the order and it was like the troops just scattered and just went on a hunt. And, it's, and, and this lady said it went quiet quiet. They started killing in silence. Oh my God. It, I was there like a good two and three hours to go through the genocide. And when you go outside, they have the mass graves. People tell me they used to be open, but now they covered them in cement. And it's like, you got a big old slab and then it have like three. And then they say, what, you wanna go for more? And I'm like, no, I'm good. Because I am told that they have about over 200,000 bodies buried under that concrete. And even some people who work at the memorial tell me that, uh, you know, told me that this young man said, I don't have anybody else in my family left. So he says, I come here at least once a week. I go to that mass grave and I talk to my family uh, just to get a connection because I don't have anybody else. Whew. The capacity for mankind to inflict pain on each other is just astounding to me. That a human being can turn into a killing machine and kill their brothers, their sisters. They have uh, another, in another area, they show gen genocides that have happened in other places. And the idea is that they said, it happened to us. You're not immune, it can happen to you too. And you know, the current environment that we have in our own country is of such grave concern to me. When we start pointing the finger and then saying so-and-so derogatory term, just anger, people getting death threats for voting for something or saying something, people threatening young kids because they're talking about climate change. It, it's crazy. And if you're not careful, what I'm saying is what happened when Hitler started speaking all the stuff against the Jews, people weren't worried. They're like, eh, nothing's going to happen. And when you so unbothered and uncaring and while you just saying oh it's okay nothing's gonna happen the craziness is building is building up and then it gets more and more and more in the atrocities and imagine taking a bunch of people throwing them in a room and then you know just sending carbon monoxide just to kill them off i mean who does that? What level of evil is that? I don't know. I don't recognize this country where we have, you can't disagree with anybody without being threatened with death. <laughs> I don't understand it. We can't have dialogue anymore. We all have to be homogeneous. We all have to 
be like little minion and think the same. That's, mm, I don't know. If you don't see it, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what else to say to you. Anyway, after I left the memorial, we went to, to another museum uh, where this, I think it was Belgium or German, this German guy, you know, all the colonizers were there doing their dirty deeds. Um, so now Rwanda is deemed the Singapore of Africa because the president that they have now, Paul Kagame, he was part of the group that finally ended that genocide. They came from, is it the Congo or wherever they were? PRF, I think they call their uh, group that finally put an end to the genocide. So people have a lot of love and respect for him. And he has done so much to bring Wanda out of the genocide in terms of uh, having this program, I forgot what they call it, Gakaka or something, where they allow the Hutus who had committed all the crimes to come back. And they went rogue about this campaign of forgiveness and people acknowledging their deeds. You know, you have neighbors who had killed like whole families. And then you have this person saying, I forgive you. I'm telling you this, that level of compassion and only God can do that. I don't know that I could forgive someone who did that to my family, you know, but there's so much of that going on and they're intermarrying. You're not supposed to call yourself Hutu or Tutsi. We all wandering, but you know, we all worry that some stuff is still brewing there. I, I hope not. I pray not. But what I see is a people that is trying really hard to lead normal lives. They're very quiet because, you know, I'm thinking they just have been through such trauma that they are very calm. Um, they do stare. They don't stare at you in Ghana as they do in Rwanda. But they are different in stature. They're a little bit taller. A lot of ladies have short afros. Um, the little girls all have their heads shaved. Uh, and I'm told this is something the schools require just to keep them from focusing on the wrong thing. Uh, I love their cultural dances. You know, they have their arms up and they have the guys with the white hair flipping. Um, the culture is still very calm and polite. Now, I dealt mostly with the young men and they're very effervescent. They're talking. They all want to come to the U.S. And, you know, I call them my nephews, you know, the the manager and a couple of drivers and but the ladies are more subdued uh when i step out of the gate i get lots of stares but not in an uncomfortable way i was able to find like a little cafe that was closer to my place so i get some wrap and i i had i had some lattes and i was like oh my god i'm in heaven but they're very quiet. And I, and I would think it would take a little bit of time to become friends with some Rwandans because they're so reserved, right? Traffic is not as bad as in Accra, but what they have is a proliferation of motor taxis, motorcycle taxi, which is the cheapest way to travel. And same as in Ghana, they're weaving out of traffic, turning right and left. And yeah, they do that too in Kigali. But uh, I didn't experience potholes like I did in Ghana. The roads are a lot cleaner, uh, paved. Um, Kigali is deemed the cleanest city in, in, in Africa. That's because they hire people to just clean the streets every day. They have a, a crazy, not crazy, a great system uh, of gutters on each side of the road that I guess the rainwater goes through. It's usually spotlike clean. There's no trash in there. Whereas in Ghana, you see a lot. 
I understand that you're not allowed to use plastic bags in Kigali. That's banned. And once a month, on the last Saturday of the month, everybody goes out and cleans their neighborhood. And they say even the president goes out too, which is kind of neat. Uh, I think they also have a car-free day to reduce emission, even though there's a lot of petrol uh, odor in the city. So when I'm driving in the cab, I usually put my mask on just to protect from the, that gasoline smell. Uh, a lot of Toyotas in Africa, they got that market. Um, in Ghana, they have a lot of um, small little cars that are taxis. So they don't have Uber, but in Ghana, they have Bolt, they have Yango. Those are two apps that I downloaded. And then if you need... Um, Someone to come pick you up, you just put in there and you call like you do an Uber and they prefer cash. So remember that. Uh, the food in Kigali, in Wanda, I didn't see anything ethnically uh, Wandan. I don't know if there is such a thing. I asked, they say they, eat, they do a lot of beef because cows are very prevalent in Rwanda. And I think even they even borrow cars, uh, not cars, cows uh, for weddings. Uh, it might be part of the dowry, I guess. Uh, but they have a lot of cows. And that is great business because they export to other countries in Europe. So that's part of their uh, income for the country. Um, uh, they do a lot of potatoes, rice. Somebody says sweet potato, even though I didn't see any. They do some kind of stew, which is different from the stew that we would cook because they usually do tomatoes and the meat and something to thicken it, but I didn't see any vegetables. Again, they're not so much into vegetables. I have to, I had to ask for some spinach and then they brought me spinach. But when you go to the market, I did see carrots and broccoli, but it's not strong. It's not something that I see on every plate. No. So you kind of have to be intentional about getting vegetables. Um, again, the country is, they say it's one of the easiest countries to do business with. They, uh, the government has been uh, strategic about attracting investors. So if anybody wants to go to Kigali or Rwanda and wants to do business is a very simple process. Whereas in Ghana, it's a little bit more complicated. And again, you need a male Ghanaian to show you the rope. Um, tourism is big. I did schedule a safari. It was so cute. I saw zebras, um, giraffes. I didn't get to see a lion, you know. We drove through a whole park and they were hiding. Uh, there was an elephant that was hiding too, but we saw uh, fawns and buffaloes and monkeys. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I went with this young man uh, in a 4x4 Toyota Jeep and I said I didn't want to be outside waving to the animals. I wanted to be inside the car. I got out only one time to take a picture because I've seen some stuff about animals not biking too many visitors and coming and attacking. <laughs> I think we saw the drivers like, leopard, leopard. And then I see this big cat that he just went so fast inside the bush. I didn't get a chance to take a picture. And we saw... Was it a rhino or hippos? Hippo, hippo, hippopotamus. We saw a couple, there was a family. Uh, there's a place called Hippo Beach. And they come and sun themselves. It was really, really nice. Um, culture, very respectful. Again, I didn't see too many old people. So people my age, I don't know, they keep us in the, in the country in the villages. <laughs> I don't see old people out. A uh, lot of people walking. Wandans are very much into fitness. They have a cycling team, people walking, running. 
The place is very hilly. Kigali is called the city of a thousand hills. You're either going up or down. So your, your cardiovascular system should be really good and you should have strong legs. So I would love that to be going up and down. Um, when I was going through the, um, when I was going to the safari, we drove, it picked me up at five o'clock in the morning and they were very punctual in Kigali. I didn't go anywhere in Accra where they have CPT time, but, uh, Kigali five o'clock, they were there. Got to pick me up to go to the airport on point. So I like that a lot. A few children that I saw, again, they were so well behaved. You didn't even hear them. And they were very kind and polite. So, you know, right up my alley. I didn't see any kids, any teenagers walking around with their pants hanging on their leg. I didn't see any of that. I saw a lot of natural hairstyle, lots of braids, which is great. I didn't see a bunch of really bad wigs. I didn't see a bunch of that, so that's good too. Anyway, uh, the young man said, you need to come back so I can take you through the whole villages. And you know, as we go through the villages, we see people, <clears throat> we got to a point where we even saw fog. It got foggy and the temperature dropped a little bit. They had rice field and kids in school. Education is free and um, they have pro public school, which is free and they have private school. They said that, uh, that is expensive. And healthcare is free. Uh, the government subsidizes healthcare and most one then pay $8 a year for health insurance. And the poor, who can't afford that, they are not, they are covered. Even though if they can't pay that, they, you know, they say they, they have a duty to provide um, care um, to, to, to their uh, residents. So, I mean, America, what are you doing? We can't even give people basic health care. And a small country like Wanda is able to do it. Again, you know, when it comes to stuff like that, you just need people with the will to do right. Unfortunately, it's getting from bad to worse. People are just in it for themselves to be right, to be in power. They don't care about people. They don't. Politicians, I mean, I did not have a lot of respect for them before. It's even more so now because I can see it's a bunch of self-interest and it's sickening really sickening so they have uh, a lot of other tours so tourism is big in wanda because they have the gorilla tour some people say you know they have like from for days and some people pay thousands of dollars to go see the gorillas i decided to do a plane safari i'm not that crazy about these big gorillas just to watch them eat bananas I, you know i i'm not into that Plus, they have some um, uh, tours where you have to go over on a little thing that's suspended. <laughs> you know, you have to walk. This girl can't do that, okay? Remember, I'm afraid of height. So anything like that, it's like, no, 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 no. So that's why the safari was perfect for me. We just in the car weaving back and forth. And then I got out and I was in civilization <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness let's see the genocide the safari the villages so uh what's his name Walvins, the the young man he said yeah you need to come back and i'll take you to the whole country so i can see the villages yeah as we were driving through there were some really small little houses uh, in Kigali, they have some really nice homes, but there were things about the homes in Africa I wasn't really happy with because they're into tiles. They have tiles on every floor. And I'm like, people with, uh, you know, older people can slip and fall. They're going to break something. So that's not good. Uh, the bathrooms don't have counter space. 
enough for you to wash your hands. And I'm like, where do you put your makeup and stuff? So maybe because you're not supposed to wear makeup. I don't know. But uh, there are things that um, would have to change, uh, you know, uh, to cater to older people in a country like that. So tourism is big. They want to, investors to come and invest and build businesses and uh, hire the people to lift them out of poverty. So whether you want to do healthcare, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Infrastructure, agriculture is big in, in Africa because we have a soil that is very fertile. We just need processes. Like they're saying that uh, milk, cheese, butter, things like that, Chicken, some people have chicken, but you have wild animals who may eat the chicken. Eggs is a big business. Honey, chocolate, coffee, tea, um, essential oil, essential oil, uh, shea butter. I mean, there's so many opportunities for business. People just need to know how to access and hook up and, and get things going because, you know, Africa is rising africa is doing a lot of good things so if you have an opportunity to go visit so you can get your mind changed please do so 41 minutes i'm gonna have to stop uh i hope you enjoyed this video if you ever have any question you could send me a message i'll be so happy to uh, tell you what my experience so that you don't repeat the mistake that i made and you feel better prepared to enjoy your trip to the motherland that's it, you guys. I love you. God loves you. Au revoir. À la prochaine.